Hello, my friends. This is Tom McLaughlin, writer, director of Jason Lives, Friday the 13th, part six. Also lead singer of The Sloths. And you are listening to the 80s slasher librarian. <laughs> They thought the nightmare was dead and buried. They were wrong. Jason lives. Happy Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, part six. Jason lives. Rated R. Starts Friday, August 1st at a theater near you. Greetings, Slashaholics! Welcome to episode 19 of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am joined by the 80 Slasher Librarian, Josh Guru. How are you doing tonight? Doing good, Sean. Thank you. Excellent. And we have a special guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself for the fans? You're, you want me to introduce me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm Tom McLaughlin. And uh, as some of you know, writer-director of Friday the 13th, Jason Lives, Part 6. Yeah, see, this was an interesting one. I was waiting, I thought, I was waiting for applause. I guess I'm not going to get it. Thank you. Uh, I actually, I saw this one out of order. This must have been the third Friday the 13th I saw because my blockbuster just had bits and pieces of every franchise. So ah. this was a really energetic intro into the Friday the 13th series. I mean, how do you go from part six to watching like part three? You know, it's kind of like a weird dynamic yeah, yeah. there, but I absolutely so I love this movie. Thank you. Sean, Sean came into the uh, horror genre late in life, so uh, uh, he uh, some of these movies he hasn't seen yet. But uh, and the, like the, he he talks about like Freddy and Jason movies, seeing them out of order and stuff. So I have to remember that sometimes with his uh, with his opinions and likes and dislikes. Um, yeah, because every time I have an opinion, everyone wants to jump on me. I'm like, hey, <laughs> blame blockbuster. Uh, yeah, blame blockbuster. There you go. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Tom, for joining us tonight. Uh, can't you. wait to talk about the movie and uh, this other Jason thing you're, uh, you've been talking about. I'm curious to ask you about that. Okay. Uh, real quick, I want to uh, say thank you to the patrons of the channel. So uh, tonight's podcast is brought to you by Tony DeVore, Simonoli, Tyrone Kennard, Nick Belkov, Jeffrey Quick, Daniel Mackey, David Arnold, Alex Vanover, Krista Campbell. That's your uh, mother, right, Sean? That's right. uh, Rob Davey, Jay Gardner, Willow Ravenwood, Lauren Vaught, Kristen Kay, Michael, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Bree Girl, Bonanza Jellybean, Ryan Woodward, Allison Seib, Iron Alexa, Hawaii, not the state, uh, Cecilia Spears, Sean Campbell, Catherine McClear, and Carl Eakins. Thank you all, wow. and thank you, Sean. Um, wow, that's great. That's more people than seen the movie, I think. <laughs> I don't know about that. This is, uh, this is okay, that's the first a question. That's great. That's very cool. Yeah, they're 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 amazing people. Um, what I do is really expensive. Uh, getting all these old out of print books and trying to preserve them. Uh -huh. uh, people people are selling these books nowadays for hundreds of dollars sometimes, and uh, it's it's a heck of a mission. I've done fifty of them so far. Wow, that's great. Yeah, they, I, I wish that they would just reprint the things, and I wouldn't be needed. Uh, but uh, this way, they don't slip into obscurity. Um, the big I got, I got to say, I always enjoyed the beginning of uh, Friday 6. The kind of like, if you compare it to the beginning of Friday 5, it's almost like Tommy kind of had a premonition in Part 5 and that dream of how he would eventually uh, resurrect Jason Voorhees, you know? Did that, did, did that beginning of Part 5 play any part in your uh, writing The Resurrection? No. I, in fact, I didn't even, I don't even remember that, to be honest. Um... No, I, the, the marching orders for me was basically, uh, we're going to kind of pick up where part four left off. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're not going to say five didn't happen, but don't follow that storyline. Oh. And so the main thing was bring Jason back from the dead. So the first idea instantly, being an old Universal's monster fan, um, was the Frankenstein you know, legend of how to how to how to animate a bit a body. So I always have argued the fact that he's not a zombie. He's more like what Frankenstein was: dead, resurrected, and now you know, unstoppable monster. So yeah, no, I I didn't um, 
you know, other than the reference to uh, that Haas says in the beginning about, you know, if they, if they <laughs> caught us doing this, you know, they'd throw us back in there and lock us up permanent. So that's only the kind of, you know, I think that's the only reference to the where he's where he's been. Okay. Well, where I, was that? Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I was going to say just at the beginning of part five, it's like uh, Corey Feldman had the one part where uh, he's dreaming that he's seeing these two guys go up to the grave of Jason you know, and they're checking to see if he's in there, and he comes out, and it was, they didn't, they didn't, like, stick a metal pole in him and lightning strike it or anything like that, I was just, I just always had this, uh, fun fan theory in my head that he saw, like, a premonition, he's watching himself do that, you know, uh-huh. uh, I, I know I, there's I, no continuity. I love there. that, you know, fine, I love that, <laughs> let's go with that. So. There's so, there's so many things, so many holes along the way with the series that you kind of have to make up your own mythology to make it make sense, because when people are making movies, it's sort of like, well, I don't want to do what we did in the last one. Or, well, wouldn't it be cooler if the, ma- the mask looked like this? Well, that doesn't match. Ah, but it looks better. Yeah. So everybody's always coming up with stuff. And, you know, that whole thing of from, you know, the original Friday to part two, I mean, the timeline is, you know, all yeah. depends on your theory on that. You know, exactly. what, how did that happen? And it's fun to do that. Like, I've got a little theory I'll talk about later uh, that connects eight and nine, you know. Uh, but uh, a big thing about this movie was kind of the, the the vibe of the movie that you went with, kind of a self, uh, self-parody. self um, A lot of people see it that way anyways. I, yeah. I just think that it, it didn't take itself. It was just a fun movie, you know. It didn't try to take itself too seriously from... Uh, from the James Bond intro, which is like the best out of the entire series. Oh, um, I, I use that clip a lot in my intros uh, for Jason books. Um, there was actually a bit of subtle imagery that I really enjoyed in the beginning. I mean, first of all, the cinematography in this movie is just fantastic. But uh, yeah, John uh, Grandhouse, you know, big shout out to him. He did a great job. Yes. One thing that gets me is that whenever. Whenever there's a scary movie and there's skeleton, there's always worms, there's always maggots in the skeleton. I'm just like, what are they eating? You know, there's nothing there, especially if they've been there for hundreds of years. But Jason, there's a, there's a big fan theory that he's he never fully died. Like he was just really really damaged, and it makes sense that there'd be maggots all over him because they would they would be continually eating what he's trying to regenerate. And when he gives that jolt of electricity, it finally brings him up to actually get out of the grave. And that's just a really powerful scene. Uh, especially like going back and rewatching it, I'm just uh, that's really cool. Yeah, the book. The, the I love book, that. <laughs> that's great. The book itself says that the maggots couldn't even digest Jason. Right. They were trying uh-huh. to. Eat. Yeah. I don't. I didn't know that. That's <laughs> Neither could the killbillies, right? Oh yeah, there's a book where some hillbillies try to eat Jason's dead body, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah what i what i was getting at is like we got the james bond intro and then we've got the uh the whole uh, credit card in the water thing um uh, mm-hmm. people shouting out don't leave home without it um i bet that was a fun time uh, i wish i could have seen this movie in theaters uh, yeah. i was still a bit young when it came out but uh, i saw it as soon as it hit vhs and uh but yeah so yeah. what was your connection your relationship with the series before you wrote part six? Were you a fan of the previous movies uh, going into this? Well, I'll have to kind of tell you from a you know, filmmaker's uh, point of view. Um, I grew up loving horror. I mean, it was Edgar Allan Poe was the first thing I kind of gravitated to when I was about 11 or 12. And of course, when I was a kid, I, it was all the Universal Monster <laughs> movies always felt like a freak myself, always felt like the outsider. So, you know, those movies were perfect to to have identification with. Um, You know, as the genre, you know, kind of continued uh, into the uh, 60s, which were all the kind of Roger Corman ones and stuff, and I used to ditch school and, you know, go and watch those in the theaters that played them at noon. And it was basically me and pedophiles and, couple of homeless that would be in there. And uh, then it was, you know, when the 70s hit, um, you know, the the Omen and the Exorcist and uh, Rosemary's Baby, I mean, suddenly it became a very class act, you know, with big stars and, you know, incredibly you know, emotional movies. You know, they weren't low budget. 
So as the 70s continued, obviously, with, with the, the, the slasher franchise after Halloween, who started yeah. it all, uh, and I was a huge fan of that, I, you know, again, seeing it with an audience, you guys have no idea what it's like. I mean, it's, it's like a roller coaster ride. I mean, where the audience is just constantly noise. Uh, when we had our preview of my Friday the 13th, I couldn't hear one damn thing through the whole screening. You know, it was just one big roar that continued. And they had been standing out in line for about eight hours waiting to come in. So they were, you know, definitely toasted and ready to go. But that was like that in a lot of theaters. The, the crowd just really, you know, was wild. So in terms of the slasher movies, I was trying to get this first movie I did, One Dark Night, off the ground. really hard because everybody wanted, you know, girls in a forest with some sort of mass, you know, character. So yeah. there was every variation of that. I loved the first Friday the 13th. I thought it was really, you know, really cool. When I saw the second one, I went, I mean, my immediate reaction was Elephant Man. Why are they doing that? And I didn't quite get that. And then I sort of, you know, there were so many of them, I kind of like kind of zoned out until the job came. And then it was like, well, I better go back and do my homework and really look at these and try to put together some kind of mythology, something that, you know, we could tell the audience, catch them if they'd never seen it before, catch them up with the history and so on. Yeah. So I really kind of came into it going, well, it's the sixth one. I want to have fun. I want to see the kind of movie that I would love to see. I wanted to have a sense of dark humor running through it. And uh, but at the same time, try to deliver the scares and bring things that had not been in one of those before, you know, like the, the little kids at the camp, the yeah. underwater fight, the car chase, you know, there were so many things, the motorhome thing. I, I just, you know, I wanted to be more of like a really exciting movie that also was a Friday the 13th. Yeah, and this was a return to Crystal Lake because, I mean, we saw Crystal Lake in the first one, but every other film was a camp across the lake. It was a rehabilit rehabilitation camp. It was people's houses. But this was not only a return to the camp, but like you said, bringing back the children, changing the name to Forest Green, bringing in the counselor. So this very much was reviving pretty much everything that made this series great. And that's what I loved about this movie. Uh, yeah. the, lo the look of Jason, um, all the characters blending with each other, bringing back Tommy from part four. Um, I feel that this movie is what a lot of people try to make when they make new Friday the 13th movies, take the best parts and make it better but and you know sometimes it fails sometimes it 
doesn't, but um, yeah, this this movie succeeded on pretty much all points. It was pretty much everything I wanted from a Friday the Thirteenth movie. Okay. In a way, in a, in a way, it was like a revival again. It was like it was like a reboot <clears throat> after Part Five. And I am old enough to remember news stories and stuff <clears throat> about excuse me <clears throat> about fans uh, really being hyped for Jason coming back. You know, after yeah. Part Five didn't go the way they wanted it to, even though that movie was a success too. Um, people wanted Jason back, and the title, Jason Lives, man. I remember uh, just seeing, like you talked about packed theaters, I remembered seeing like news stories where they were jo- showing people lined up outside these places. It was a really big deal that year. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, they, were, they were events, all these movies they were like events because people just had been waiting after the last one ended, you know, when's the next one, you know? And uh, obviously the the video market at that time really fed into that because like Nightmare on Elm Street wasn't that big of a hit, but yeah. when people started to see it on, you know, on VHS and things, it built an audience so that then it just really took off. We'll never have, I don't think we'll ever have a, a time like that again, uh, you know, where everything's like digital and stuff now. But I, I just used to love going to the video store, getting a VHS, seeing yeah. the new horror, horror selections. Um, but yeah, you mentioned something that I wanted to talk about, uh, bringing in the little kids into the store. Because yeah. this is a big thing with this podcast and the books I've, I've read. Uh, and I know I've what asked, question you're going to ask. Yes, yes, you do. Um, I know that like they're, they're probably like, don't let Jason kill a bunch of kids, but... It just seemed like Jason was more intrigued by the children yeah. than he was wanting to kill the children. Like, because uh, he could have went through that cabin and just killed them all in their bed. Oh you yeah. Know? Uh, was that like him connecting with his lost childhood, or was he just getting ready to kill the kids? I gotta know. <laughs> okay. Um, well, from my standpoint, um, Jason really had an agenda in this movie. Very simple get this fucker that brought me back from the dead. I was relaxed, I was fine down there, I was resting (laughs) in peace, and bang, now I'm back. So, you know, first thing is I gotta get the guy that did that. So there's kind of a clear, you know, objective for him, and the same thing with Tommy. You know, he screwed up, you know, he came there to burn the body and make sure it's over, over, and all he did is bring him back from the dead. So they both had agendas. So when Jason comes into the cabin, you know, he's looking, you know, for Tommy. He's looking, you know, to see if anybody confronts him because he, obviously whoever gets in his face goes down. And, you know, he's got a bunch of sleeping children. And then when he sees the little girl that looks at him, there is some kind of connection. And there's some stuff in there that, you know, I'm sort of leaving open for the future. And there's some things like through there, uh, through the, the whole movie that I'm, you know, planning on doing for, you know, the this, this sequel that I want to do. So there's there's elements that I tried to put in there just in case I ended up, you know, doing another one. But at that time, I, I had no ideas, you know, specifically what I could do that would make it different. You know, now I do. But at that time, the whole thing with children was like, yeah, to me, it made sense. Why wouldn't, the, you know, the camp open and have kids and, yeah. you know, the locals think they, you know, they're fooling people by changing the name to Forest Green because, you know, you say Camp Crystal Lake. Isn't that where all those kids were murdered? No, I'm not sending my kid to that camp. So <laughs> yeah. it was all about, you know, covering up and pretend this didn't happen. And then as the sheriff says, you know, this crazy kid comes in there and starts talking Jason shit again, and he's going to lock him up and shut him up and get him the hell out of town. So, they, you know, they were really, you know, denying that. But, you know, Tommy says it, you could call it Forest Green, but it's still Camp Crystal Lake to Jason. So, and he's going to come back where obviously his, his, you know, hunting ground is. How many movies, how many movies is the hero b- responsible for the mess they're cleaning up? You know, it, it's like you see that so much. The hero- I mean, there's like two Iron Man movies where he's kind of responsible for the villain starting up. Yeah. But you know, is it, uh, wasn't Forrest Green brought into Friday the 13th Hell Lake, the book? Yeah. Was it the yeah, Forrest yeah. Green Police Department? Yeah, I think that trickled into that that uh, chaos of a book. That book is so bad. Uh, yeah, Tom. I don't, even, I don't even know about that. What is that? Okay, it's, it's, there, was this, <laughs> there was these books put out in 2005 and 6 by Black Flame Publishing. I've narrated them. Uh, they're out of print, too, but they were original stories. 
in this particular book, uh, we have this theory that the guy had written a horror slasher novel, found out about the 25th anniversary thing, and just shoehorned Jason into it. Uh, <laughs> Jason, Jason has a best friend in the book. Jason cries in the book. Uh, Jason wears a welder's mask because he prefers it over a hockey mask. Mm -hmm. uh, he shoots a rifle a couple times. Um, I, just, I just remember someone shooting him in the ass and he screamed like a banshee. He screamed, yeah. He gets, <laughs> he gets shot in the sphincter and the privates. Uh, and he wears somebody's face like Leatherface at one point, drives a police car. Um, it, it's, it's horrible. Uh, it's so bad, so bad. But they, they use Forest Green instead of Crystal Lake uh, for it. So. Ah. Okay. Uh, one big thing I'd like to ask is, was there anything you wanted to do in this movie that you didn't maybe didn't have the budget for, didn't have the time to do? I mean, I know there are a couple elements that made it into the novelization, but I'll just look to see if you were going to expand on that. You know, uh, most of it, I mean, they were really good to me. I mean, I really was able to make the movie I wanted to make. Um, and I, you know, all those kills certainly were you know, longer than you see it on the cut down version that, that was released. Um, but I wouldn't say that they were incredibly more, you know, graphic as the stuff that John Buchler did, Buchler, on part seven, uh, where he really lost some the major, major, you know, bloodletting and blood and gore. Um, so they're, they're just kind of cut down um, more than anything else. But the big thing, of course, was Jason's father. You know, I, I love the idea of introducing him as this particular character that's just, you know, looks just pure evil. I mean, you know, that this this guy would be where Jason would get that, you know, that part of his DNA. Uh -oh. um, you guys reason, up. And reason to not do it was that uh, Frank was really afraid that fans would think the next one's going to be about Jason's father. And they felt after part five and Tommy putting the mask on, you know, a lot of people went, no, 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 I'm not going to go see the next one if it's going to be Tommy as Jason. So that, that's why I was taken out. But it's still in the book because that, they, I think they saw my, obviously, original script on there. You know, in fact, uh, I'm going to go ahead and play a clip of that scene from the book. I wasn't going to do this but since Tom brought it up. I want that. I want everybody to be able to hear that at least, because uh, this was his vision, and I think it would have been awesome in the movie myself. Uh, so yeah, if that's cool with you guys. Sure. All right. Martin crouched down over one of the graves in the Eternal Rest Cemetery, pulling up weeds. It was a warm day, and the old caretaker worked slowly. No need to work up a sweat, he told himself, because these folks ain't no hurry. They sure ain't going anywheres. He chuckled at his own witticism. Yep, it sure is a good day, he thought, sun shining down, gently on a man's back, warming up his insides. Soft breeze blowing from the north, no forecast of rain for a change, so the arthritis wouldn't be acting up. And he had a full bottle of wild turkey waiting for when he finished up his chores. He sighed with contentment, grateful for the fact that his job was still secure. He'd be all right so long as he didn't ever have to sober up. A shadow fell across him, and the old alcoholic looked up, startled. A look of tense, frightened recognition passed over Martin's face, and he quickly dropped the weeds and struggled to his feet, dusting his palms off against one another. When he spoke, his voice was overly friendly. His manner, that of a fawning, servile dog. You! Ah! Ha! You frightened me, he said, slouching, almost genuflecting. I, I was just, you know... Cleaning up the place, uh, you know. The tall man in the dark suit stood motionless, silently staring down at the old caretaker. Martin squirmed beneath the directness of the gaze. Uh, um, nice to see you again, Mr. Voorhees, he said, bobbing his head, avoiding the man's eyes. Haven't seen you in uh, Crystal or uh, Forest Green in quite some time. The thin, pale face was framed by long, dark red hair, heavily streaked with gray. It showed not a flicker of expression. The features were fine and chiseled, deeply etched. The mouth was thin and cruel, but the eyes... Don't look at them eyes, thought Martin, no matter what you do. Hey, I've been taking real good care of your wife and son's graves, said Martin, his voice trembling slightly. 
Don't look. You'll be real pleased. Those eyes were like a snake's eyes, cold, feral, ancient. They made Martin think of mausoleums and crypts shrouded with cobwebs and covered with the dust of centuries. They made him think of beasts snarling and snapping at each other, teeth rending flesh and crunching bone. They made him feel as if a thousand worms were writhing underneath his skin. The man silently reached into his back pocket, and his gnarled hand withdrew a wad of bills. Wordlessly, he handed the money to Martin, who took it gingerly, careful to touch only the wad of bills and not the claw-like hand. Uh, "'Thank you, Mr. Voorhees. Thank you!' Martin said, bowing and scraping like a serf before an aristocrat warlord. His face averted, looking at the ground, at the man's feet, shrinking from the burning gaze of those ancient, baleful eyes. I'll leave you in private like you... Uh, okay, uh, bye. Uh, thank you, thank you. The old drunken caretaker scuttled away between the tombstones, clutching his money like a starving dog hangs on to a bone. Sweet Jesus, he thought, sweat pouring off of him. Sweat that stank of sour mash. Thank God I got that grave cleaned up. He would have blamed me if he knew, but I cleaned it up. New sod and everything, and it looks good. Oh, thank God. Oh, Jesus, thank God. Voorhees walked slowly between the rows of headstones with a stately measured tread, almost gliding like a dark predatory jungle cat. He stopped before the pair of tombstones, marking the graves of his wife and son. He stared for a long moment at the simple inscriptions. Then his gaze slowly traveled downward to stare at his son's grave. The burning eyes narrowed slightly as they bored intently into the mound of earth. He leaned closer, and his eyes grew wider, his pupils dilated. It seemed as if he was looking right down into the earth, his gaze penetrating the soil like x-rays, seeing the coffin of his son and the strange broken body that it held now, the corpse of Alan Hawes. Slowly, Jason's father straightened in turn to look after the old caretaker. Inside his shack, Martin upended the bottle of wild turkey and drank deeply, feeling the fire of the whiskey burn his throat, unable to stop shaking. He suddenly felt cold, as if someone had walked over his grave. He couldn't stop shivering. He sank down into the floor in the corner of his little shack, hugging the whiskey bottle to him with both arms, trembling like a leaf and saying over and over, I didn't, I swear, I swear I didn't, Mr. Voorhees. I didn't, I didn't know, I swear. Voorhees turned away, his eyes scanning the horizon, searching. His eyes traveled in the direction of the lake several miles away, not visible from the cemetery. Crystal Lake was tranquil, sunlight sparkling on its bright blue surface, but underneath something started rising, something white, something that moved quickly toward the surface. The hockey mask bobbed up and floated on the surface of the lake, like a face gazing up at the bright sky with sightless eyes. For a moment everything was still, utterly still, like the silence of the grave or the calm before the storm. Then the wind picked up and swept across the lake, through the woods toward the town of Forest Green. A bank of thunderheads moved in, roiling the sky, and as the shadows lengthened, the tall, dark man silently turned and left the cemetery, slowly weaving back through the maze of tombstones like a specter. Now, that makes you stop and think, who would have been a perfect cast for his dad? Oh, God. Um, I don't know why I'm picturing Sam Elliott, but <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a uh, little, little too cool, you know, to be his dad. Um, you know, I guess what was in my mind was somebody that we've never seen before that had one of those faces like, um, what was his name, Julian Beck? in the second poltergeist yeah. uh, with reverend yeah. he just had this face that you go holy shit you know i didn't want it to be anybody that you know you'd seen before um in one dark night you know when i did the raymar character tom berman you know made the raymar character 
And I didn't know until maybe three, four years ago that Raymar's face is act actually Christopher Walken, because at that time, you know, he had a mold of Christopher. Chris, I'm doing great today. It's okay. Uh, Christopher Walken, and he used that as the basis for Raymar, figuring that this was some actor that probably would never make it, and you know, why not? So I mean, that that was a real surprise to me when I learned that. But yeah, as far as uh, Jason's father, um, I didn't have a name for him. Uh, Elias came up later on, maybe from the cartoons. I mean, you guys may know better than I do uh, from you know the comic books um, of. of you know, Jason of uh, uh, Friday the 13th uh, that kind of did, did dealt with his mother and all that. Um, so I think that's where the Elias, you know, came from. But I just saw him as, you know, that's Jason's father. And, you know, whether he actually was married to her or not, I kind of, you know, had a different agenda for that, which is in the game. If you, you know, play Friday the 13th, the game, if you get the little um, surprises that you pick up along the way, there's a whole sort of like radio play, but it's yeah, the mother uh, talking about her son on the on the night that he drowned, and so that gives a little more insight into Jason's father. So it's you, interesting. You wrote some of the. Are you saying that you wrote some of the Pamela tapes? Yeah, I wrote all of them. Yeah. Wow! Excellent. There you set. Uh, one of my subscribers actually wanted me to ask about that, so there's your answer. Um, yeah. Yeah, Tom wrote them. That's awesome. I I love that game. I. I played that thing nonstop for like the first year, and then I got all butt hurt when Uber Jason wasn't going to get put into it. And uh, but I still yeah. play it from time to time. But yeah, I got I listened to the Pamela tapes. Those were really interesting. Um, There's actually a a piece of that um, talking about Jason's dad that was we we were doing an interview um, a week ago, and they were or no that was that was Final Destination. It was the week prior where they were talking about in the original script that Pamela Voorhees had a, um, a high school class ring, and it was going to be indicative that uh, the boyfriend left her, and um, I'm not saying this very eloquently, but basically the boyfriend left her, and she was ha having to raise Jason herself. So you're supposed to get all that backstory just from the flash of the ring. And it was supposed uh -huh. to be a subtle nod to um, her whole backstory just from a flash of a hand. And I didn't know if um, you had read any part of that or were part uh -huh. of any of that. No, well, you're, you're like I said, you know, we, we all kind of create our own stories, and that kind of all falls into the mythology. And I just felt that, you know, uh, what I saw in the comic book of this big burly guy that beat her and caused you know Jason to look deformed and all that wasn't what I had in mind. I was thinking of much more of a you know thin, statuesque, evil you know person that actually, you know, as, as you know from reading the things, actually raped uh, Pamela and why she was married to Elias. And that was part of the reason that he was so, you know, violent and stuff, um, because it wasn't his kid. So again, that's, you know, something that I, I you know, <laughs> thought up. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, too, because just recently there was a, a fan-funded movie called uh, Vengeance. Uh, yeah. Friday the 18th. And they called me and said, you know, is, are you okay if we actually do Jason's father? And I said, yeah, go, go for it. And he goes, well, we also are going to get C.J. Graham to play, you know, him. And we'd love you to be a, the caretaker at the beginning of the thing that takes care of their graves. So I said, yeah, I'm in. And, uh, you know, now they're going to do a sequel that was so successful, you know, which I'll be back again and C.J. will be back again. Awesome. Because we're not getting the movies that, you know, we want from... Warner Brothers a new line and until they settle that um, you know that lawsuit uh, unfortunate. You know, so between those guys but I mean on the flip side of that it's because of the lawsuit that we're getting these incredible fan films uh, brilliantly done with the script and just the passion just really shows in these in a way that we just don't haven't really gotten in some of the movies to be completely honest it takes yeah. that it takes a massive amount of passion to really make these come across you know perfect yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think it's great if you're a young filmmaker and you've got something that has a built-in audience and you get a chance to, you know, try your skills any place in the world. You know, I've, I've seen a really, you know, cool one from, from England. I've seen one from Germany, you know, and it's, it's just great to see 
somebody who just loves it and they have, you know, just a camera, I'm sorry, just a cell phone for the camera yeah. and they make it look great. You know, it's, no it's, budget, it's, no budget whatsoever, just heart. Yeah. Well, that yeah, and drones, too. Awesome. Drones are great for cinematography with a lot of these. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I got to ask this. Your original vision was to have that ending with the uh, great, with the, with the caretaker meeting with Jason's dad. Um, yeah. Does that, I know that like when they told you they wanted more kills for the movie or whatever, I think I saw that in an interview before you had to like, you killed off the caretaker and the couple on the motorcycle because they wanted more kills. Is that, that's correct, right? That's correct. And also when, you know, we did, we saw Sissy get pulled through uh, the window, but we didn't see what happened to her. So we added Jason twisting her head and pulling it. And of course, in the original version, you know, you really saw the skin stretch and the, I mean, it was looked really cool, but that unfortunately got cut by the censors. So we just sort of beefed up a few things based on what you know Frank uh, Mancuso felt from the the preview that we did. And I go, I don't know how you could tell anything. It was just one solid, you know, roar through the whole thing. As I said, I, I wish yeah. they hadn't cut so much because nowadays I don't think they would. There's so much worse stuff in movies, uh, you know, than than that and. Uh, it's there's no, I know it's just there's nothing we can do about it now. But I wish that uh, they hadn't been so like anal about all that. Um, but I got it. What I was asking is the caretaker meeting with the father. Does this mean that the cover up continues in your original vision for that? That uh, that the father wouldn't know what just went down since he still believes Jason's in the grave. Uh, that there's that there the cover up includes all the stuff that they're already covering up the events of part six. Well, I think they're they're kind of creating their own legend, uh, you know, with the Vengeance series is that there is sort of a a knowledge, you know, be it paranormal that if the father has that that Jason's not in that grave, you know, where is he? And then they kind of set out with both of them, you know, doing kills in that movie. Oh no, and, I meant before Vengeance. I'm sorry. I oh, meant like whenever you made Part Six, since uh, since that was going to be the original ending. Uh, oh. The father still thought Jason was in the ground, so does that mean that the co that they were already covering up the events of the movie at that point? You know, I I the, the at least what was in my head is he was staring down there, and there was a sense to me was something is not right, and that yeah. was that he was already kind of picking up. You know, Jason's not not there. I mean that that was the intention, and then See, that works really good with vengeance. So. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, Sean, did you have any questions about the uh, ending with the with the father? No, I mean I, th I thought that was an interesting addition, especially reading the novelization. You always get the, the problem with the novelization, and it's something I brought up in a couple of these podcasts. That some of them, it's like you almost get angry if they're too similar, but then you get angry if they're too different. It, it's it's finding that balance in this and having yeah. that extra ending with Elias answered a couple questions that we hadn't had before it, it left you wanting more um yeah. it's pretty much what exactly what i would want from a novelization it kind of reminded me of the novelization of halloween where they went a little bit into the backstory hundreds of years ago in ireland what potentially is motivating michael to kill so it was close enough to the movie but it had extras that you actually it felt refreshing and, that's and we what got I like jason's about head a lot too uh, they put us yeah. in jason's head in, in part in the part six novelization and, and uh, that, that was, was very reminiscent about going into Jason's head in part two of the novel or the novelization of part two, where you get to go into Jason's head in the classroom, Jason's head, especially in the sixth one. That was really interesting seeing how he feels about being brought back to life. That was just, you know, it was interesting, his thought process about it, it was a little primal, but it was, it was intelligent enough that where you can understand the anger that he's going through. Yeah, yeah kind of like Tom was saying, you know, he's pissed what uh, Tommy's done to him. Um, I, I did appreciate that y'all brought Tommy back as the protagonist. Was that your decision, or were you told to use that character? Um, I'm trying to think back on that, uh, because I know they they didn't want... There, there was either he was asking for too much money, or he had become Christian... Or he just you know didn't have any interest in it. John Shepard, who played Tommy in Part Five, so I was basically told you know 
you know, his, he's not going to, you know, be involved with it. So at that point, I thought, well, I could take this a different direction. Um, but I sort of said, well, you know, could we recast? And he goes, yeah, why not? So I thought, all right, well, it's nice to kind of leave on four with, you know, Tommy being traumatized. There's the, uh, the Corey Feldman one. And then, you know, cut the years later, you know, he's older and, you know, he's still fucked up. You know? So um, it, it, I think it, it was like, yeah, that's OK. Go that way. You know, but it wasn't like this is what we want. You know? And then I wanted to have obviously a girl involved that was really feisty and smart mouth. And, you know, to, you know, yeah. she was really driving a lot of the stuff, too. They, their um, scenes together were great. They they worked really well together. That chemistry yeah. was amazing. Yeah, they had a great chemistry. You're right. I hated seeing the the uh, sheriff Garris die. Uh, I think that's the one time in a Jason movie where I was like, damn it, you know? Because uh, as a father, I get it, you know, uh, coming out of that bush to protect your daughter, uh, yeah. no one's gonna die. It's just it's just a big thing. As a kid, I didn't get it. As an adult, I get it now. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting how the perspective changes when you get older, particularly when you have children. Yeah, it, it changes it because uh, you're not—you don't think it's your kid's about to die. You're going out there, but uh, the book goes into such gory detail with this whole backbreaking thing. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, the movie got it perfect. Don't don't try to, you know, don't don't. We get it. It's back broke. Okay, just stop. Like it's it's so. I don't know if you've ever read uh, any Stephen King like. Uh, Gerald's Game. You guys yeah. ever read that? Yeah. Uh, the, this how like it goes on for like two pages about how the handcuff is ripping the hand oh. off. You know, <clears throat> when I saw the movie, I was like, I, I'm not gonna be able to watch it. I couldn't even think when I read that part. I can't. Um, but yeah, so that that whole back breaking thing. I know it was an easy uh, special effect. You know, just having somebody, you yeah. know, down there, or whatever. But it yeah. looks so good, and that's what I was gonna get at. And this isn't butt kissing. Uh, out of all the Jason movies, honestly, as a whole package, part six is the most consistent, uh, you know, with the special effects, the story, the atmosphere, uh, Jason. Even though I love Kane Hodder's Jason, C.J. Graham was an amazing Jason. Like, he, yeah. he really, I don't know, you can tell when it wasn't him, you know, in the uh, scene with the paintballers or whatever. Yeah. Especially um, like the close-ups on the <clears throat> eye was almost like like reptilian, just with the, like the fury. Just like this, there, there's something not quite human about this, but it almost yeah. enough human to pass off. So yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. you know, it, the thing that was great about CJ is you know he you know came out of the military, so you know he had that stance, he had that kind of you know attention. You know, I'm, I'm listening to orders that are going on in my own head. And so he moved, you know, with these, you know, very sharp moves, which you know, we talked about. And the fact that he was electrified, to me, there was a little of that sense that he's, you know, a, a little bigger than life in certain respects. And what Kane did, what I thought was so great, was the, you know, the breathing yeah. that, you know, he did as his anger got bigger. But I was going, you know, kind of a different direction with the fact that he's just been brought up more in the Frankenstein way, there's a little more stiffness, but it's strong. I mean, you know, very, very strong. There, to, to me, the ending, like, I've seen a lot of horror movies, but for, for some reason, the only one I have nightmares about is Jason, because he just, he never stops. He's this hulking monster that's just this relentless force. And the scene, when Tommy's in the boat, and he's trying to lure Jason, but Jason just starts walking straight into the water until he disappears. That That's terrifying because he's in the boat, and he yeah. knows Jason's down there, and he's he's looking around, and it's almost like that, that, that fear you get when you watch Jaws. But this time, it's like, it's not a shark. It's a person that yeah. shouldn't be able to do I what he's doing, shark. but he is, and just, that is nightmare fuel for me, just him going under the water like that because he's just, you, you'd think in the water he'd be helpless, just like most people would be, just kind of, awkward but he's not he has this cool kind of grace when he goes in yeah. and there's that, that's a really really powerful scene for like the entire franchise so that's how i picture him getting to uh new york in part eight just walking on the bottom of the ocean you know <laughs> i picture just like marching along the when they're just like walking on the bottom of the ocean to go up the boats I mean, he's yeah. definitely not down there like scuba dive swimming or anything. No, that would have been a good <laughs> silhouette to use like in the future. Just the, the dark shape of the moon coming through the water with this figure just walking slowly. That, that, that'd be a good scene. That's cool, yeah. 
I would have yeah, loved it's, it. it's funny too, again, going back to the good old days of when these things were shown in movie theaters with audiences that were very vocal. I mean, that scene in particular, uh, when they thought that Megan was going to get her head crushed, like the way we saw the cop, you know, do that. And then Tommy pulls the attention away and like, I'm over here. I'm the one you want, you know, maggot head. And so people, as he, as Jason was going, it's like, oh, he's in trouble now. Oh, shit. Oh, now you fool. No, you know, and everybody yelling at the screen, you know, and to Tommy, don't, don't do this. You know, and then we disappear. Then people literally up out of their seats and moving around, uncomfortable. It was it was just great, you know, seeing it with a crowd that was so into it. You know, it was a wonderful time. I would love like if they would re-release the movies in theaters, like as a special thing when everything you know clears up with theaters and we can go back to them. Uh, I would love to go back. I saw part three in the theater, which sucks because part three is so low on my list of favorite Jason movies. <clears throat> but it was it was it was still cool getting to see it on the big screen. Mm-hmm. I can only imagine seeing my favorites like six and seven and uh, ten and stuff. Uh, I actually on, tried to. Do I saw like Jason that. X in theaters when I when it came out, but uh, I never got to see any of the other ones on the big screen besides three. Sean, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, buddy. No, no you're good. Um, I was just saying that there there's a film center in Denver, and there was there was a horror group I was um hanging out with, and they actually rented out the center to do a Tobey Hooper marathon. So I got to see Texas Chainsaw one and two on the big screen, and. It would be great to do that because, like, they actually had a leather face there. They had barbecue. You know, they made a big night of it. I would love for someone to host a Jason night to do some of the iconic films because, I mean, I've only seen one Jason movie in theaters, and that was the remake of Friday the 13th, which I know a lot of people have problems with. But the fact of the matter is, like, it's the only Jason movie I've gotten to see in theaters. So it's it's going to mean a little bit to me yeah. um, as a personal thing. But... Oh, yeah, I would love to see these movies in theater. That would be so fantastic. If we didn't have the COVID thing going on with the whole 40th anniversary of Friday the 13th happening, I feel like it would be a perfect time to put the movies back in, like, for, like, two days apiece or something, you know, like they did with, like, Jurassic Park and stuff. Right. Um, But that would be cool. Yeah. You know, I'd love to see them on the big screen. Um, But you're writing a sequel, right? Like, in your free time? It is written. Uh, it has been it's done finished. now for, oh, I don't think it's quite a year, but pretty pretty close to it. Um, but yeah, I, as I said earlier, you know, I had the opportunity to kind of, you know, continue, but I, I really didn't have any great ideas. And uh, Frank offered up Jason Meets Freddy. And I went, mm, I don't know if that would work, because Jason's in, seemingly in the real world. Freddy's existing in the nightmare world. You know, how those two work, you know, and he goes, well, well, we'll worry about that later. Let me just see if I can get new line, you know, to, to say yes. And, of course, they didn't. They wanted to keep Freddy uh, with their um, with their studio. And so he goes, you know, do you have any other ideas? And I said, well, you guys own Cheech and Chong, right? What are you saying? <laughs> said, John and Jason. <laughs> and he like, laughed. Like, and I Albert said, you know, I have a Costello with Frankenstein. I said, I, you know, the, the thing would be, you know, trying to make it still scary with with yeah. them in there and i mean that was his main objective uh, objection was that you know they the hits audience uh, jason audience is very different from the you know, cheech and chong audience but i go no everybody gets stoned together and they exactly. go and I, you know, I think it would work and it only recently was kind of you know brought to light that that was something i wanted to do and then the next thing i heard they started talking about you know doing another cheech and chong movie in some way so, you know, we'll see. But I know it's late, of, but here's my money for that one. You know, I'll give it all <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to see that movie. Um, I feel like they tried to do that in part three. I think they got some guy that looked like Tommy Chong to be an ish character, but yeah. <laughs> didn't really go anywhere. But I, I would love to see that movie. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why they objected to that. That would have been, those audiences are probably mostly the same. You know, uh, I mean, if they can do Ginger Dead Man versus Evil Dog, <laughs> they can do that film. Yeah, I don't know. To me, it's like the rock and roll audience, particularly the metal audience. You know, is very much part of that whole thing. And I, I did a whole discussion about that yesterday uh, in an interview I did for the new um, big box set that Shout Factory is coming out with. So they've got so many additional, you know, features in there, and there's a bunch of stuff that I, you know, added in as well. 
And it was, you know, we had a whole whole long discussion about metal and and horror and and who influences who, you know, in that, uh, which was great, you know, great fun to kind of talk about. And of course, Alice Cooper, you know, you know, having done the soundtrack. That was my uh, next question. <laughs> was uh, Alice Cooper? Um, was that your personal choice to get to ask Alice? No. The interesting. The, the most interesting thing about this is that we had tracked the, the 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 movie with various different you know uh, rock and roll songs songs that we knew we couldn't have but i wanted to give the vibe for when the you know producers looked at it and things and the studio looked at it um and one of those was an alice song and then frank came to me later and he said what would you think about alice writing a song for the, the movie and i went are you kidding well, you know, he goes, yeah, our, his people contacted us and said he'd like to do that. And I said, can we get other Alice songs? And he goes, well, I, I don't know, we'll ask. And, you know, he was a big fan of the series. So he, you know, gave us those other songs to use as well as writing Man Behind the Mask. Now, when in the mid 60s, uh, I was in a rock and roll band called The Sloss, which we've resurrected over the last 10 years or so. And I played on the same bill with Alice. In those days, you know, the man he was with was called the Naz, and he was, you know, Vincent from Texas. That's all I knew, you know, and we'd hang out in the same places and stuff, but we weren't really friends. We just, you know, were guys that were part of the rock and roll scene. So it was this kind of ironic thing of, you know, that, that, that we have that in common, but still to this day, I have not like been in the same room with Alice at the same time to shake his hand. And it just okay. has not happened yet. Uh, which I'm looking forward to, you know, at some point, because I've been sitting man with that man behind the mask, at pretty much every Halloween with the with the Sloss, and uh, you know I love that song, so it's it's great fun to sing it. We need to make this happen, you know. Uh, hashtag Alice shake Tom's hand, you know. Um, <laughs> this has got to happen. <laughs> I, actually have a funny I don't story. think any hands are going to get shaken during COVID. No, not right now. <laughs> shake his hand two years from now. Um, Set, set an appointment. But uh, yeah, no, I, I never, I, I kind of veered off and didn't answer your question about the script. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that finally all the parts came together for me. And I wanted to make a movie that, I, as I was writing it, I'm sitting in a the theater thinking about how I would react if I saw this. So hopefully the fans will feel the same way as me now as a big fan of the series um, about the choices that I know I made in the script. And you know, one of those was to set it in 1999. So we're right on the cusp of turning, you know, into the you know 2000. And there was a lot of fear. It has nothing to do with Jason, but it just was a kind of a strange period. Secondly, that period also has a lot of the 80s that were still kind of going through it. So we can still kind of maintain that old school look. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was set it in the winter so that we would see Jason for the first time actually in a winter setting. I was just picturing, you know, the breath coming out of the holes in the mask, you know, when he's when he's upset, that the girls that are involved with this particular thing at the camp have no idea about Jason Voorhees. They're on a, you know, basically I'll call it a retreat. Yeah. Um, that they come up there and so when these things start happening and they see this monstrous looking man and they have no idea who he is what his history is they just need to survive so there's a lot of you know things that i tried to create with different type of kills in it different type of suspense situations and then there's a you know a big story twist that occurs at the end of it that you know does have kind of a harken back to jason lives so as i said i, I for the fans i wanted to keep that that sense of continuity there and for people that, you know, never saw Friday the 13th, that the movie would still work as a great, you know, horror movie. You know, it kind of kind of makes me think about all the <clears throat> younger kids and stuff that don't really know Jason other than just it's the hockey mask guy. Yeah. It, it's kind of that tone you're saying, like these characters don't know who Jason is, don't have any idea. They're going to find out, you know, yeah. and... Uh, I like I like that. That would be awesome. I hope I hope that we get to see that one day. Um, I do too. <laughs> I would love to direct it. Oh my so, god, it'd yeah. be awesome. I mean, I wish they had brought you back for seven. You know, because um, I was going to say part well, six. My fault. I, I I said no because as I said, I I didn't want to go into something where I didn't 
I didn't um, have like an inspired idea. We well, see I, with part six, there's only a couple of the Jason movies that if it was the only Jason movie you ever saw, you could enjoy it. And I think part six is one of those. Uh, yeah, it's a continuation of Tommy's story, but enough of that story is explained that you can start that movie. And there's plenty of movies where the, the movie is about, you know, picking up something from the past where there wasn't a movie before it, just the story. And part six, and I think like Jason X is another one, uh, that you can just go into the movie and enjoy it as a standalone. And that's another thing I love about Jason Lives. Um, it's a continuation of a story in a previous movie, but you don't have to see the previous movie uh, yeah, to but, enjoy it. Yeah, so. we, we, hear, we hear the backstory <clears throat> in, in a kind of a humorous way, the way Megan tells it to the other, you know, to the other uh, camp, uh, camp counselors. But yeah, I wanted it to be something... I didn't expect it to kind of be like the gateway drug into Friday the 13th, but over the years I've had a lot of people say that was the first one that I saw, yeah. you know, and I was really young and my parents were okay that I saw that one, and <laughs> which is weird, but I guess because it had certain elements about it that was, you know, more kind of universally acceptable. It wasn't just, you know, a, a gore movie and it wasn't just, you know, have sex and die, you know, exactly. like, had to have a little more story with it. But honest to God, guys, when I finished that thing, I thought the fans are going to hate me. They're going to hate I put humor in it. You know, they're just going to hate the fact that John Shepard's not Tommy, that there's no continuity, you know. And I am literally more shocked than anybody else that here we are almost, what, 35 years, 36 years, whatever it's been, you know, that it's been such a favorite for so many people. And that, you know, the amount of fan mail I still get or emails and stuff, um, you know, I had a, a, a birthday last uh, s Sunday, and I mean, I had almost a thousand, you know, birthday greetings from all over, and I'm going, this is just bizarre, and it's mainly because of that movie. I mean, you know, it ain't me, <laughs> you know. It could, have been, it could have been weirder. It could have been, uh, there was... There was one novelization of part three where Jason was kind of racist. Uh, it, it could have gone that direction. Yeah. But, uh, um, oh, one thing I wanted to bring up is uh, I actually, fun story, I went to an Alice Cooper concert a couple of years ago at Halloween. And yeah. he did, when he did The Man Behind the Mask, there was uh, this little girl, she was like a, a camper, and she she was trying to ask him for directions while he was singing with like a map. And Jason came onto the stage and he dragged the camper out of the screen and at towards the end of the song the girl comes out with a bloody machete and the mask and is just happily dancing <laughs> kind of like swinging through and goes back behind the curtain but that was kind of funny it was like a nod to that that's um, great it seems like he has a lot of fun doing that mm -hmm. uh i know we didn't talk about it a, a, a ton uh the novelization of the book um no <laughs> excuse me novelization the book of the movie the novelization of the movie um but I thought Simon Hawk did a really good job uh, taking your story and making, because a lot of these authors, I've read a lot, and uh, I could tell, like you said, I kind of figured some of the lines being different was stuff on the set of the movie. Maybe things got changed or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always given this movie five stars out of five. It's If I'm introducing somebody to the franchise, I would rather them watch part six first than like part one. Um I give the book five stars too. Uh, what do you think, Sean? Five. Five on both accounts. It was yeah. uh, the novelization. Like I said, it was close. It was close enough to the movie where I felt like I knew where I was, but it added enough new things to where I was. I was satisfied that it wasn't just a carbon copy, um, and I was excited to see more of what the script might have been originally versus yeah. what we got for the movie because it kind of shows me which direction things would have gone. So yeah, five on all accounts. That's and, great. Uh, Tom, I had, I had no input. What's, in fact, I was surprised when there was a novelization. I went, there is? I mean, I had no idea that, that Simon had done this. And so when I looked at it, I had that same fear that this could be really yeah. awful. And, you know, he added so many elements, you know, to give it much more of a, you know, fuller, like you were talking about, fuller, you know, sense of, of story and thought processes and things, which is what makes Stephen King so incredible as a writer is because we, you know, we get into these characters' heads, and lots of times it's very hard to make a movie out of some of these things. That's why certain ones work really great, and other ones just, yeah, the book was much better. You know, it's, yeah. and that's part of it. You just can't, 
add that element of, of you know being inside someone's head as those as those as the books do. Tom, thank you so much for coming on. And as a fan of horror movies since I was a kid, by the way, I forgot to mention this earlier. You said it. I can even play a clip here. Um, a few shows back, I was talking about how I got into horror movies. And the way I got into it was reading Edgar Allan Poe in grade school. Um, so when you when you said that earlier, that that was kind of your introduction, that just, I was like, wow, that's awesome. Because Sean, you remember me saying that, right? That was yeah. my uh, the Telltale Heart was my introduction. Ah. What got me into horror. Uh, so that was awesome. So as a fan of horror slasher genre, super fan, thank you so much for your contributions to the genre and to filmmaking in general. I really hope we get to see that sequel one day, and I can't tell you how much respect I got for you, and how much I appreciate you coming on here and talking to us, and uh, look forward to having you chat with us here on the after show. So, uh, if you're listening and you're a patron, uh, we're about to hop over to After the Slash. If you're not one yet, you can join up for really low, like two bucks. It helps support the channel, and uh, you get a weekly exclusive after show, and so much more. Uh, but yeah. This has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue, saying thank you so much for listening. Be excellent to each other out there, and uh, have a great night. Sean? This is Sean Campbell saying, if this one doesn't scare you, you're already dead. Anything you wanted to add, Tom? All right. If you like rock and roll, check out The Sloss. Yes. You know, my band, we're still going. Thesloss.org. Love to hear what you you know have to say about after you hear the music. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll put links and everything in the description below. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks.